beyond belief, fact or fiction. Hosted by Jonathan Frakes. Tonight, your challenge is to separate what is true from what is false. Five stories, some real, some fake. Can you judge which are fact and which are fiction? To find out, you must enter a world of both truth and deception. A world that is beyond belief. Sometimes it's difficult to label things accurately. Take this display of an object that is shaped like a mouse. Yet, when you rotate it, it evolves into a cat. So which is it really? You'll find the same challenge with our stories tonight. As opposite as the mouse is from its mortal enemy, the cat, so is the truth opposite from a lie. And still, as in this sculpture, they can be found together each one a part of the other. So don't jump to conclusions about whether our stories tonight are based on actual events or completely false. We may just be playing our typical game of cat and mouse. The art of decorating one's body has fascinated cultures back to the early days of the ancient empires. In our own society, tattoos once frowned upon as reserved for the lower class or sailors on a drunk now adorn many of the world's most beautiful people. There is something seductive yet frightening about these intricate works of body art. And while many tattoos can be obtained these days in fashionable salons, there still exists the seedy dens of danger and mystery known as the tattoo parlor. This is where our next story takes place, but be forewarned, it may leave its mark on you. Renny Fortis wasn't the kind of guy you'd want your daughter to hang out with. That's probably what made him so attractive to a young sheltered girl like Amy Dwyer. Amy rebelled at just about everything her parents represented and she truly believed she was in love with Renny. Why are we stopping here? I told you, I had a surprise for you. <laughs> a tattoo? A special tattoo. You're going to love it. I don't know about this. I hate needles. They really freak me out. Hey, I thought you loved me. I do love you. You know I do. It's just that I... Hey! If you really love me, you'll do this. I do love you. But I'm afraid. Listen. There's nothing to this. I'll be right in there with you. Come on. Do it for us. Amy, this is uh, Wes Trunker. The best tattoo artist in town. Ain't that right, Wes? I can't complain. What do you need, Rennie? She wants a tattoo. Have you ever had a tattoo before, young lady? No. I haven't. What do you think you're up to? Here? Maybe you ought to mind your own business, huh? Yeah, you're right. Sorry, Reddy. Well, I'll tell you what, young lady. Well, why don't we go around and uh, see if you find anything that pleases you? She doesn't have to go around. I want you to do this one. No, I can't do it. And I won't do it. Oh, you're going to do it. You're going to put that tattoo on her neck. Do you understand? Rennie, what are you doing? Shut up. He's just a superstitious old man, that's all. 
a myth attached to the devil's tattoo. But it's all bull. Can I just get a different one? No. I want to get this one. You run along the west and do what he says. I'll be right back. Okay, Brady. Come in here with me, please. Everything's going fine. Yeah. She's gonna do it. You climb out that window and you get out of here now. What? You gotta get away from that guy before it's too late. Stop it, you're scaring me. Well, you wanna be scared. The last two girls that he put that devil's tattoo on would never seen a game. Why don't I hear the needle, Wes? I don't wanna get the tattoo, Remy. It's too late. Promises have been made. Stop it! Let go of me! Let me go! Shut up! Or I want to kill you. I thought you loved me. Wes, pick up the needle and go to work. What's going on? I don't know. There's something wrong with the needle. Stop screwing around and do the job! Wes, please! Please, don't tattoo me! Shut up! Wes, pick up the needle! What are you doing? I'm not doing anything. I'm doing it on its own. Oh, oh my god! No! Tattoo artist Wes Tronker maintained that he was not responsible for the death of Rennie Fortas. Supported by Amy's testimony, the case against him was dismissed. Did the tattoo artist cleverly set a trap for his villainous customer? Did he commit murder in order to save the life of the young woman? Or was the tattoo gun itself possessed by the spirit of two innocent young girls, past victims of the devil's tattoo? Is this story engraved with the permanent markings of truth or is it written in disappearing ink? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a strange curse hounds a businessman on beyond belief, fact, or fiction. These are just a few of the products from paper to medicine that come from trees. These things certainly make our lives easier, and yet some environmentalists tell us that by destroying trees, we make our own lives more fragile. Preston G. Yates, is a wealthy man who has no time for tree huggers, as he calls ecologists. In fact, he curses them. But he's about to find out that money earned by the destruction of nature may carry a curse of its own. Some might see Preston G. Yates as a nerd who made good. His company was a multinational corporation. Protesters have always been part of Preston's life. He never took them seriously. They were just another pain in the neck. Gates was about to sign an agreement with the Japanese company to be their exclusive supplier, and those protesters weren't about to stop it. Mr. Yates. You are killing off the people of my tribe by destroying the rainforest. Oh, uh, not another one. Soon, there will be nothing. You have been warned, but you refuse to listen. You are cursed. Come on, that's ridiculous. Look, if you or your tribe has a problem with Atlantis paper, I suggest you contact our attorneys. Hear my words. Whatever you do to our trees will return to you forever and stick to your very soul. Yeah, well look, I'll tell you what, Magic Man.
This was one meeting Yates would never forget. Gentlemen, good afternoon. It's good to see you again, Mr. Yates. You're looking well. Thank you. Please be seated. So I take it your people have reviewed the contract? We have, and everything seems to be in order. Great. Well, then I'd like to propose a toast. To the rainforest and all the riches it has brought and will continue to bring. Well, uh, gentlemen, what do you say we sign the contract before we eat? That would be fine. Great. I have a right here. Okay, uh, I'll get the contract. Hold on. No! Oh! Are you all right, Mr. Yes. I'm fine. I'm fine. Here you go, sir. We should reschedule this meeting for another time. I think we need to review this contract more carefully. We'll be in touch. Well, uh, uh, how, how about later this evening? Uh, I'm, I'm available this evening. The problem continued to worsen and paper was sticking to Yates so often he couldn't keep up with it. In fact, he began missing all his appointments and eventually stopped doing business altogether. I'm looking for an Indian. Yates finally decided that he had to locate him? the old Indian and get him to remove the curse. Stop staring at me! Stop staring! Just stop it! Stop it! You were looking for me, Mr. Yates? You... You gotta break this curse. Only you have that power. How? Tell me how. I'll do anything. <laughs> I already told you. You must give me your word that you'll stop killing trees. But I can't. It's my work. Then you must live in your paper prison. Ah! Can't take this anymore! All right! All right, I'll change. I swear. I was wrong. And I'll work to save the rainforest from this day on, I promise. You made the promise. Now you must keep it, or the curse will return. Save the rainforest, stop killing trees and people. Preston G. Yates turned Atlantis Paper into a recycling company and began working to replenish rainforests around the world. The curse never returned. What really happened here? Did the old Indian's curse really stick to Preston G. Yates, both literally and figuratively? 
Or did Yates suddenly develop a condition where his body conducted an excess amount of static electricity, the way some people can walk across a carpet and then set off tiny sparks whenever they touch them? Or was Yates so paralyzed by the fear of the curse that he willed it to come true through telekinesis? Is this story of a man who attracted paper like a magnet a tissue of lies? Or are we sticking to the facts? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, two dead bodies and an unsolvable crime on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Criminology. Fascinating science. By using the tools of the trade, specialists can reconstruct the scene of a crime, sometimes down to the smallest detail. But what happens when the scene of a crime is so baffling, the crime becomes impossible to analyze through science? It's then that detectives must turn to their greatest tool of all, the human mind. Detective Bill Ballard has a mind that is capable of both analysis and invention, and is going to need both skills to solve the strangest case of his career. I'd been a homicide detective with the Beverly Hills Police for the past 10 years, and I'd seen a lot. But a murder in a locked funeral home? That was a first. So the question was, how was he killed? The second victim was lying on the floor next to the casket with a knife sticking out of her chest. Something was out of whack and then it dawned on me. There was no blood from the wound. The woman had already been dead for a few days and was probably in that coffin. Hey, Ballard. Have you ever seen one like this before? Never. Why would anybody stick a knife in a corpse? Six times. And how did she wind up on the floor? Good question. She didn't just jump out of her coffin. What about the guy by the door? Well, my guess, he was probably poison entered through the wound in his hand. We'll know more after the autopsy. Thanks, Angela. What the hell went on here? A corpse stabbed repeatedly outside the coffin? Some instinct told me to check around the coffin. Somebody'd spent a lot of money for this send-off. That's how she got out. Hey, Bill. Did you find the funeral director? Yeah, yeah, he's pretty shook up. I think he never saw a dead body before. Uh, the corpse's name is Miriam Jacoby. She died three days ago in a traffic accident. She was loaded. I mean, we're talking big money. The guy over there is her third husband, uh, Daryl. So he came to pay his respects? Yeah, looks like it. You know, uh, the funeral director told me that his wife took him out of her will completely. This is real. It's got to be worth a couple of million bucks. No, that's real. You know, she had some pretty strange requests in her will. The body was delivered here yesterday with specific instructions that no one was to open the coffin. And then she wants to be buried wearing this hunk of ice. What a waste, huh? Somebody thought so. Also, what do you think? It was a botched robbery. What? How? Who? Daryl Jacoby didn't come to pay his last respects to his dead wife. He came to steal her diamond necklace. He slipped into the room and made sure he was alone.
He used his buck knife to jimmy open the lock. The same knife that ended up in her chest. Then he reached in and grabbed a hold of the necklace. That released a barbed metal spike that shot down and punctured his hand. This ticked him off, so he yanked on the necklace even harder. That's when the spring mechanism kicked in. This is really incredible. Careful. I'm sure it's still covered with poison. Well, who do you think rigged it? My guess, Mrs. Jacoby. What? She probably left instructions with her lawyer. Yeah, but if she didn't want her husband to take it, then why did she wear it? It was bait. She knew he'd come after it, and she wanted him dead. Yeah, but why? Who knows? She must have cut him out of the will for some reason. All right, let's say everything happened the way you think it did. How'd the corpse get out of the coffin? As Jacoby struggled with the corpse, he pulled her free, and they both fell to the floor. At this point, he's totally spooked and very angry, so he stabbed her repeatedly. All that activity caused the poison from the spike to kick in quickly. He was desperate to get out of the room and away from the nightmare. He got as far as the door. Mrs. Jacoby knew what kind of man her husband was, and she rigged a trap to snare him. <laughs> You're amazing. I mean, this all fits. No. No, it doesn't all fit. What do you mean? The scratches on Jacoby's face. Where did they come from? I don't know, you probably got him earlier. If he got those scratches somewhere else, then why is there fresh skin and blood under her fingernails? Were the scratches on the husband's face a result of the struggle with his wife's corpse? If not, how do you explain the samples of fresh skin and blood under the wife's nails? Could the crime scene have been manipulated by a third party, or is it possible that the wife's restless spirit returned to her body for one last act of revenge? Is this story open to a judgment of truth, or have we placed the last nail in a coffin of lies? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, two young thieves break into the house of a dead hero on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Whoever said nostalgia isn't what it used to be hasn't seen the latest market prices for memorabilia. Collector's items similar to these fetch huge prices, thousands of dollars at auctions and conventions around the world. Even something as simple as an autograph can be worth... Th Patrick Stewart. Lash Connors was an action-adventure star in the heyday of the Western hero. In his movies, Lash always stood for truth, justice, and the cowboy way. But something has just happened to Lash in real life that's never happened in any of his adventure movies. He's dead. And now the real adventure is about to begin. Legendary cowboy hero Lash Connors was considered the king of the Western two-reelers back in the 1940s. The year was now 1957, and Lash was on the comeback trail with a new Western television series. <laughs> then tragedy struck. At the age of 41, Lash Connors was found dead in his bedroom of a mysterious gunshot. His death was officially ruled a suicide, but questions remain to this day. Whatever the cause, a great American hero is dead. 
Hundreds of mourners came from across the country to pay their respects. Johnny Pope and Larry Rucker had driven in that morning from Bakersfield, California. But they didn't come to offer their condolences. He was quite a man. My daddy took me to see all his movies when I was a kid. I bet it's worth at least 20,000 bucks. <laughs> I just can't believe he's dead. What? Lash Connors. He's dead. Get over it, Larry. We're here to rob the place, not cry over some dead cowboy. I know. I just feel a little funny about it all of a sudden. You better not be chickening out on me, you hear? I ain't chickening out on you. Good, because there's stuff in that house worth a fortune and it's all ours for the taking. Sure make it sound easy, Johnny. It is easy. If anyone gets in our way, they'll be sorry. What are you looking at? Buzz off, kid. Somebody forgot to lock it. Piece of cake. I can't believe we're in Lash Connor's kitchen. Come on, we got work to do. He actually ate here. He probably sat right here at this table, drinking his juice, reading the morning paper. Would you come on? We gotta get moving. Somebody might come home. Sorry. It's just kind of amazing to me. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Look at this place. It's almost like being in church. We just hit the treasure of the Sierra Madre. <laughs> Start filling your bag. Those are from Ambush Gulch. That's from Outlaw Stampede. And those are from The Legend of Steel. Would you stop it? Oh my gosh. I don't believe it. What are you doing now? It's Lash's saddle. He wrote on it in all of his movies. Yeah, well now it's just a big old hunk of silver. You know, we ought to melt it down and sell it for scrap. Melt down Lash Connor's saddle? You can't do that. I can do anything I want. Who's gonna stop me, you? Wait a minute. Do you hear something? It sounds like a horse at a full gallop. Maybe someone just left the TV on. N no, that ain't no TV, that's, that's a real horse. It's coming this way. All right, grab the bags. All right, the window's closed. Who closed the window? Not me, I never touched it. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. 
what is happening? Get it open! Somebody's coming. I don't believe it. It's him. Don't you boys know that stealing is wrong? If you two keep riding down this trail, pretty soon you're gonna be high-tailing it from a posse and end up kicking air at the end of a rope. Let's get out of here! Open it! Open it up! Where'd he go? I don't know. Johnny Pope and Larry Rucker both changed for the good that night. They went on to lead honest, productive lives, and neither of them ever forgot the words of a local hero, Flash Connors. Who was the cowboy who confronted Johnny and Larry that night? Was it really Lash Connors? Had he somehow faked his own death, or was it some caretaker who lived in the house and decided to dress up like Lash to teach the boys a lesson? Or was it really the ghost of Lash Connors playing the hero one last time for a couple of misguided buckaroos? What's your guess? Did this story really take place? Or are we just roping you in? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show. Next, a young man tries to capture a ghost from his past on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Those that are gone need not be forgotten. By keeping photos or personal items, their presence stays with us in our daily lives. Danny Truitt has vivid memories of his father, although he was a young boy when his dad died. But the photos and souvenirs his dad left behind have stayed with Danny all of his life. And right now, Danny's facing a crisis of his own, and he has no family to help him out. What Danny does have is a loyal girlfriend, a strong spirit, and a life that's about to take a twist of fate and travel to a place beyond belief. Danny and I have been going together all through high school. He had lost his father in the Gulf War eight years earlier. Then his mom got sick and she died. We had both been accepted to Cal Berkeley, but with both his mom and dad gone, Danny was putting college on hold. I can't do it, kid. It's just no way. Even if I got a part-time job and financial aid, it still wouldn't cover tuition. Then I'm not going either. Oh, yes, you are. I'm not letting you wreck your life because of my problems. Well, your problems are my problems. Look, I know how rough these past few months have been. I've gone through them with you, and I can't just run off to college and leave you all alone. You have to go, okay? I'll get a good job and, and join you in a year. I, I promise. No, you won't. What kind of job are you going to get? You'll never make enough money. I sat there in silence, trying to hold back my tears. Okay, I love you. Why'd you punch on the brakes? It's my father. It's me. Are you okay? It was my father. I'm sure it was him. He looks just like I remember. He's alive. Danny, he can't be. But it was him. He's got amnesia or something. I don't know. 
There, he just went into the surplus store. You saw him, didn't you? No, I didn't. Come on, let's go. Dad! Dad! It's me, Danny! Danny, <sighs> he's not here. Kim, I didn't imagine it. I saw him. We have to keep looking. Dad! Where are you? Dad! Dad! That soldier that just came here a few minutes ago, where'd he go? No soldier came in here. I would have seen him if he did. But I saw him. He was my father. Maybe you weren't looking. Hey, take it easy, kid. Look around if you want, but I'm telling you, there ain't nobody else in here. He's in here somewhere. Dad! Dad! It's Danny! Maybe we missed an owl. We split up. Does anyone just, just yell? I felt horrible. I thought Danny was actually flipping out. All the stress of losing his mom, and he idolized his father. Dad! Where are you? James Truitt, it's my dad's. Well, was he here? Did you see him? No. I don't know what's going on, but something led me to this jacket. It fits you. What's that? It's addressed to my mom for my dad. Open it. Dated June 8th, 1990. That's the day he was killed. He never got to mail it. I couldn't believe Danny found his father's jacket and the letter. Something was happening that neither of us could explain. I don't believe this. What? My dad wrote my mom to tell her that he took out a life insurance policy on her. In my name. Him, it's worth a hundred thousand dollars. <sighs> the insurance company told Danny that his father had paid off the entire premium on his mother's policy prior to his death. The company paid out one hundred thousand dollars plus interest. Danny and I are now both enrolled as first year students at Cal Berkeley. Who was the man Danny saw that day? Was it just a soldier who looked like his dead father? If so, how do you explain the fatigue jacket with the insurance policy inside? Could Danny have been hallucinating? After all, he was the only one who saw his father's image, but then there's that insurance policy. Was this tale of the ghost in the Army Navy store based on an actual event? Or are we just presenting a surplus of lies? Next, you'll find out which of our stories are fact and which are fiction when Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction returns. Now it's time to find out which of our stories tonight are inspired by actual events and which are total fiction. Now let's take a look back at the strange curse of the devil's tattoo. Was it fact or fiction? But please, please don't tattoo me. Shut up! Wes? Pick up the needle! 
What are you doing? I'm not doing anything. It's doing it on its own. Do you think this one actually happened? If you did, we hooked you in. It's a work of complete fiction. What was your opinion of the man who was the victim of his own uncaring attitude about paper products? You gotta break this curse. Only you have that power. How? Tell me how, I'll do anything. <laughs> I already told you. You must give me your word that you'll stop killing trees. But I can't. It's my work. And then, you must live in your paper prison. Oh! Can't take this anymore! All right! All right, I'll change! Was this story too far-fetched to be true? Our research shows absolutely nothing. This one never happened. How did you judge the bizarre story of the wife who exacted revenge on her husband from her own coffin? Did this one happen? Hey, Ballard. Have you ever seen one like this before? Never. Why would anybody stick a knife in a corpse? Six times. And how did she wind up on the floor? Good question. She didn't just jump out of her coffin. What about the guy by the door? Well, my guess, we probably poison entered through the wound in his hand. We'll know more after the autopsy. According to our research, reports of this story actually exist. A similar event took place in Europe around the time of the Great Depression. What did you make of the mysterious ghost of the cowboy hero who returned to set two young men on the right path? Fact or fancy? Windows closed. Who closed the window? I mean, I never touched it. Damn, oh, man, what is happening? This story was actually based on a similar event that took place in Hollywood during the 1950s. What did you make of the tale of the young man who saw the image of his late father going into the war surplus store? Dad! Where are you? Dad. This story of a young man whose college education was paid for by the unexplainable appearance of a ghost is inspired by an actual event. It happened to a young man in the Midwest in the early 90s. So, were you able to accurately label what was truth and what was falsehood tonight? Or did the two concepts seem to blend into one? When we hold them up to the light, fact and fiction, seem to have the same face. A face that fits the description beyond belief. I'm Jonathan Frakes. The story entitled War Surplus is true based upon first-hand research conducted by author Robert Trelins. For Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction, this is Don LaFontaine.